Our reading is taken from John chapter 1. Let's rise for the reading of God's Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. There was a man sent from, John, from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. The world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. This is a reading from God's holy, inspired, infallible word. Please be seated. This is our third sermon in the Gospel of John, and you'll notice John's starting point. He starts right from heaven to earth. And this is important because the other authors, right, they're starting from earth, but bringing you up to heaven. But see, when John is putting this Gospel together under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's giving us the heavenly realm, the things that we don't see the things that we have to come to his revealed word to understand. You know, when he talks about the word who was with God eternally, who was God, he mentions the fact that, yes, all things were made through him, right? Without him, nothing was made. But yet, as we look further into John, we see that, like in verse 10, he was in the world, right? The world was made through him, but the world didn't know him. He also says in verse 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So you see, as we look at this, we may be able to come to a conclusion, right? We based it a couple of weeks ago, that when we look outside and we see the things that are created, it elevates our eyes to realize there is a creator, God. We can recognize by what he created, his power, Romans 1, right? His power, his eternal power, sustains, creates all things. But to come to that specific knowledge that the Son was also there in creation is revealed to us by his written word. Now, as we look at the text, we're going to key in on... John 1, verses 9 to 13. Let's take a close look. Let's go to verse 9. He says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Now consider this. What is this light that gives light to everyone who is coming into this world? We talked about it. We went back into the context, right? And what John is telling us is, Christ, the Son, the eternal Son, right, created all things. That light that he gives to every single person is the light enabling them to recognize there is a creator. There is a creator. But then he says this in verse 10. He says, when he says he was in the world, the world was made through him, yet he says the world didn't know him. So let's hold that in the back of our mind. The world didn't know him. So that's every person non-Jew. Then he says in verse 11, he came to his own. And his own people did not receive him. So you have the chosen ones, the national Israel, right? The chosen ones didn't receive him. And the world didn't receive him. 
But then it says in verse 12, but to all who did receive him, right? But to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, speaking of Jesus Christ, he gave the right to become the children of God. Now, last week we touched upon how, why did they not perceive who he is? And if we look at it just from the ground level, we talked about humanity has a predicament. It's a predicament that if we don't get right on this human predicament, we're going to ultimately think less of what God says is sin in us and less of who God is. See, when he says in John 1 that the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness cannot comprehend it, there's reasons why the darkness can't comprehend it. It's a bondage that every single human being is enslaved to. It's a bondage. We read from Ephesians 2, 2 and 3, that those outside of Christ walk, and how do they walk? According to the course of this world. So the world, in the time period that you're raised in, dictates to you how you will live, how you will speak, how you dress, every single thing, right? They follow the prince of the power of the air. Now, natural revelation, look at outside, you would never know that. But they follow the prince of the power of the air, and also something else that they will not know is they live by the passions of their flesh. Because of the fall, we have a contaminated heart, loaded and fertile with every possible sin, as our Lord Jesus Christ said, from sexual immorality to covetousness to thief to murdering to anger, everything. It's right there. It's packed. It's manured. It's fertilized. It's only ready for the seed, <laughs> right? The seed, the world puts it in there. Who waters it is Satan, Satan waters it, but to be able to know what you naturally don't. See, naturally, I'm born with this corruption. I don't know any better, right? Do you? Do you guys know any better? When we, the only reason why we know better is why? Because all of a sudden, what did God do? He opened up our eyes, right? And now we can see ourselves. And when we see ourselves, we're running for cover. And the cover that we run to is who? Jesus Christ, who covers us with what? His righteousness. But see, the dilemma is when you walk according to, to the course of this world, you're following the prince of the power of the air. You live by the passions of your flesh. The author of Ephesians also says, our aim in life is to fulfill and satisfy the desires of the body and mind. That is why Fallen man is by nature a child of God's wrath. By nature. Not by actions, by nature. Because we don't sin to become sinners. We sin because we have a sinful nature. So we realize that our nature is in bondage to ourselves and to the evil one. That's the first clue that's got to tell us why in verse 10 the world didn't recognize him and his own didn't recognize him. John 3, 19, 20 gives us a little bit more about this. He says, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world. John is enabling us to reflect back to John chapter 1. Light has come into the world, but people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. He says, for everyone who does wicked things, practices wicked things, hates the light. Think about that. There's a natural inbred hatred we have for the God of Scripture. I mean, we could invent a God, and, you know, we're known for that historically, right? We could invent one that'll fit us perfectly, our own personal little deity. But he says, for everyone who does wicked things, hates the light, does not come to the light. Why? Because his works would be exposed. And that tells us, folks, that when we're in the presence of a non-believer, the very fact that you're there, and you could be silent, but just the fact that you're there, it could become bothersome to them. 
and you could say something, but they're ready to say, you're judging me. You see, they're immediately ready to throw the arm out at you. And the reason for that is, as Jesus talked about how everyone who does wicked things hates the light, Paul adds to it more commentary in Romans 6, 19, is because they present their bodies. Notice this. He says in verse Romans 6, 19, they present their body parts as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So you see what the problem is with the sinner, right? The sinner presents his body parts, eyes, hands, arms, legs, everything, to impurity and lawlessness. We're rebels. We're naturally rebels with an absolute cause. Our sinful nature. Our sinful nature. Then we compound this interest when John tells us, he gives us more commentary, he says there's a distinction between people. He says we know that we are from God, the recipients of the letter, but the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Paul says you're captured by him to do his will. See, you're in prison. You're in jail. The scriptures uses the analogies of you're blind. You're deaf. You're dead in trespasses and sins. And when you take the whole corpus of biblical anthropology, the study of man from God's perspective, the apostle sums it all up in Romans 10, 12. He said, it is written, there is none righteous. Then he adds, no, not one. There is no one who understands. They couldn't comprehend it, right? No one understands. Then he says, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. The human predicament. Now we come to verse 12. Look at verse 12 of John 1. He says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right, and I love this, he gave the right to become children of God. That word right carries the idea of the power. The power. You see that? There's a power. See, there's a supernatural element here that we need to grasp because if there's anything that has invaded the church more in the last half century is a church packed with unconverted people. Because they're told a different message, right? Come as you are. <laughs> they omit the repentance. God loves you. Think about that. When a person says, God loves you, immediately what does the sinner think in his mind or her mind? Oh, no matter what I do, he loves me. You see? You see how they, they, they read that. But there's an importance here because, folks, because of this unregenerate group that have come in, what ends up happening is the world sees it and they blaspheme God. Because you say you're this, but look at you. You see? So now, as we get to that text, he says, but to all who did receive, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This power... In order for us to come to him so that we could be called the children of God, the very next word says in verse 13, who? Who? Now that word is important. You know why? Because the word who, you know, it, it, we may overlook that, but it actually is a, it's, it's, it's a plural pronoun, which goes back to the very verse right before it. Because he's describing, the, the who is describing those who received him. John is going to tell us how the world didn't recognize him, his own people didn't recognize him, but then there's a group that do receive him, and now he's going to say, 
how they received him. He says, who were born not of blood. Now think of this phrase, who were born not of blood. Now Jesus is clearly speaking to what? His own people. Remember his own? Didn't see him. Now when we think of born of blood, the first thing that should come to mind is what? Family, kindred, tradition. We're all born in a family. We're all raised in a particular faith, right? And sometimes uh, that tradition carries on. And it turns to just remote religious formalism. You know, you, I'm a Methodist or I'm, I'm a Presbyterian or I'm a Baptist or I'm a Congregationalist. And we define ourselves by our doctrine or we define ourselves by our, 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 our denomination. Or then you get the ones who are self-righteous. Well, we're non-denominational. So we're more, you know. This born of blood idea, kindred, Jesus gives us a little insight into it. In John chapter 8, verses 33. The Jews answered him, it says, and notice what they, the first thing they throw out at him. We are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. Now, you got to remember, they went to the synagogue every week. They did all the, the, the sacrifices. They tithed. They went miles to proselytize, right? They did all these things. He said, we're the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it? That you say, you will become free. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Notice what he tied into. Because they're claiming, hey, I'm the offspring of Abraham. We're not enslaved. Jesus immediately says, everyone who practices sin Everyone who practices, who goes out every day and doesn't have a problem with going to OTB, off track betting or whatever, you know, I don't know what they call it today, <laughs> King's Ransom or whatever. But whatever sin it is, you want to practice it, you want to do it. There's no remorse, there's no change, there's no inkling. You might say, well, I got my eternal insurance policy, I'm okay. But when Jesus says the slave does not remain in the house forever. The Son, Jesus Christ, remains forever. So, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now think back at what John, as many as received him, he gave the power to become the children of God. Think of this. Hold that in the back of your mind. Then he says, now Jesus answers, he says, I know that you are the offspring of Abraham. He immediately talks about their physical descent. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. Let that far be it from us, that his words, we don't reject his words. He says, I speak of what I have seen with my father. You do what you heard from your father. That's a powerful statement because you got to remember, these people had all the religion that you would want to mimic. Praying, bowing, doing all these outward things. But he's saying, you do what your father. Now remember what Paul said. The whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. Being captured in 2 Timothy 2, 25, 26, you're captured by him to do his will. You're in bondage to Satan. You're running, you're under the course, the, the prince of the power of the air. You see how all these things tie in. Then he says this, Jesus, if you were Abraham's children, now he goes to the promise. If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You're doing the works of your father, what your father did. They immediately turned and said, well, we weren't born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. They didn't have God as their father. Their religion created a God that fit them. But they used the book. 
That's something that the church needs to be on guard and see what's happening. John the Baptist knew what was going on in their minds. You know what he said? He says, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. He said, God could take these stones and make sons and daughters of Abraham. Who could turn a stone into a son and daughter of Abraham? Only God. A stone. <laughs> Imagine what that did in their eyes. So we look at it and we see, okay, the first part of 13, who were born not of blood. You don't inherit from your family, your Christian. You have to repent and put your faith in Christ. Then he says, nor the will of the flesh. Now this is the one that the modern church, whoa, they have a hard time with, right? Nor the will of the flesh. The word will means desire, inclination, or choice. So he says, nor the will of the flesh. And you think about that and you go, so Lord, what you're teaching me here is, I don't inherit my Christianity because my parents, my great, my grandparents, my great grandparents all the way back. But now you're saying, it's not my will. I mean, what do I do with all the Baptist churches down south that call themselves free will Baptist churches? I mean, they call themselves that. Well, the only one who could answer it is the scripture, right? And here's the problem, folks. You know what happens, and I, and I feel for some of them, because ultimately, let's say you're blind. You fall into the ocean. You're deaf, which means you didn't learn how to speak. Somebody comes, grabs you out of the water, puts you back on, pumps the water out of you, and then you turn around and say, I accepted my freedom by jumping out of that water by myself. You didn't, you didn't honor the one who just saved you? You didn't, the cause? <laughs> you didn't go to the cause? You see, ultimately this is what they're doing. But you know what Jesus said? Jesus said in John 6, 44 and 6, 65, and when you read the context tonight, today, you'll see more of it. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and then I will raise him up the last day. Now, you know, when we look at that, he says it again in John 6, 65. And always remember, John 1, 13 is omitted in evangelicalism. And if you force them to go at it and to look at it in the context, you're going to cause them to sin unless God opens their eyes because they're going to bend this thing like a pretzel. I'm only reading the line verse by verse. But when they come to John 6, 44, their argument usually is, well, I didn't come kicking and screaming. I came willingly. And of course, what do the scriptures teach? On the day of his power, he makes his people willing to come. You see? Psalm 110. But then Jesus adds in 665, because it was a hard saying, and they couldn't grasp that saying. He said, this is why I told you that no one can. Now remember this, folks. Think about this. Can applies ability. Right? We learned that in English. No one can. You don't have the ability. Remember what Paul says? No one seeks after God. No one understands him. Because we're captured by Satan. You can't free yourself from that prison. So he says, no one can come to me unless it is granted, given to him, bestowed upon him by my father. Now, this is important because when you take these things and then you have the New Testament give the commentary, because I want to know, so it's not my will. Is that what you're saying? In Romans 9, 15 and 16, Paul makes it clear. He quotes Moses to show this. He says, for God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Now, a natural human being doesn't like a God like that. They want a God who sits in the wings of the 
theater and just waits for us. But the God of Scripture says, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. Now, Paul sums it up. He gives us in verse 16, so then, which means it's an application here. This is the ultimate purpose. So then, it depends not on human will or their exertion, but on God who has mercy. Christ John Paul. Then he states, nor the will of man. How many of us, if we could determine the outcome of our children's salvation, wouldn't want to do it ourselves for them? Right? Wouldn't we? It's amazing. I mean, you know, we want that for them. But he says it's not our will. It's not the will of man. Paul shows it's not. He says this in Romans 9. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. He says, I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow, unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I were a curse cut off from Christ for the sake of my kinsmen, my brothers, according to the flesh. Would we not want to say that too about our children? He said, they're the Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To, the, to them belong the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. From their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, forever blessed, he says. So there's that desire. So he said, look, it's not how well the preacher is. It's not what kind of shows you could put on. See, if you honestly think that salvation is up to man, what's man going to do? He's going to give you whatever you like. What do you want out of a church? What do you want out of a church? I'll give it to you. You want a popcorn machine? You want a tramp, uh, you know, uh, uh, artists, dancers, ballets? What do you want? I'll give it to you. You want something that sounds like the Almond Brothers? I'll give it to you. But it's, the next line says this. It says, but of God. But of God. See, John has given us the behind scenes. When I see a person repenting and putting their faith, it all goes to God. He caused this, see? He caused this, but when it says of God, that means <laughs> that it's he's th the source, the cause, of our salvation. He is of God. Now here's where it gets real good. To be born of God, you'll notice natural man can't do this. First John gives us a commentary. This is what he says. In First John 2, 28, 29, he says, now little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, you may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, Jesus Christ, right? If you know he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Notice that. Has been born of him. So the first thing we clue in, if you're practicing righteousness... You're born of God. That's the first thing. Second thing, 1 John 3, 9. No one born of God. Notice again. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. What did Jesus say? If the Son sets you free, you're free indeed, right? No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Why? For God's seed abides in him. He cannot keep on sinning because he has been what? Born of God. The idea there, it's not perpetually practicing it. He's not saying you will not fall because he would never say if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins in the same letter. But he's talking about purpose and aim of life. We strive for right. We pursue righteousness, faith, love, gentleness, right? But we can only do that because you're born of God. So when he says you, everyone who practices righteousness, 228 is born of him. 
You don't keep on practicing sin because you're born of God. In 1 John 4, 7, beloved, let us love one another. This love in the letter is to the brothers and sisters in your church, in your body of believers. Let us love one another. Why? Because love is from God. And whoever loves has what? Been born of God. And you have to be born of God to put up with some of us. (laughs) Because we're still not perfectly good, right? That's the key. Then he says in John, uh, 1 John 4, 7. You know, after he says, who's ever been born of God also knows God because you're born of God. Then in 1 John 5, 1, 4, and 18. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Remember when Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Because Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Verse 18, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. That's why, folks, repeatedly throughout Scripture, we, all we hear is, blessed be the Lord, our God, who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation. And to God, the Lord belongs deliverances from death. Salvation belongs to the Lord, the most common repetitive statement in Scripture. The means for our freedom is presented in such a way how we tell people, repent, believe. And if you repent and believe, who granted you repentance? God. Who gave you the faith? God. See, the man-made faith comes to the scripture, and because it's a man-made faith, there's many of scriptures they reject because that's not the God they want to believe in. But in closing, the good news is this. The Spirit of the Lord God, Jesus said, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. We're poor. We're not talking about fiscally, financially poor. Poor in the fact that I'm a sinner, man. I just heard that if I'm born of God, I'm not going to keep practicing sin. How, how wealthy are you now? We're poor. We realize this, right? He says, but he, was, he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Look at the compassion of Jesus Christ. He, he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives. The opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is what our Lord does. If you're held in bondage, or you, you, you know, Think of the compassion Jesus had and the fact that he went town to town to town because he was sent in order to bring the good news. The good news is available. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins because your sin is your enemy. You are your enemy. Imagine I walk around every day with a 250-pound enemy with me. You know, and in the mirror is not going to tell me the truth about it, but God's word is going to get right at me and it's going to cut me up. And it's going to turn me and say, and this is where we go. Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. I, Jesus says, will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. He says, I'm gentle and lowly. Gentle and lowly. You will find rest for your souls. Come to Jesus Christ. He's not mean. (laughs) He's loving. Amen? Amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer.